Ettore Arco Isidoro Bugatti was as extraordinary as his name might suggest. Although an ingenious and inventive engineer, he had little or no formal engineering training. He had a natural mechanical ability, which coupled with his intense powers of observation and artist's eye, was to produce some of the most aesthetically beautiful automobiles the world has ever seen. He had no technical training whatsoever. In fact, the whole of his, his life, his design work, is, is uh, characterized by a complete ignorance of scientific principles, although an astonishing ability to pick up what's good and uh, uh, choose solutions which work. Hugh Conway is an acknowledged expert on Ettore Bugatti and his creations. He spent his working life as a mechanical and aeronautical engineer. And for the last 30 years or so, he has owned and rebuilt many Bugattis. He's also written several highly regarded books on the subject. Most engineers believe that when you design something, it's probably not perfect the first time. Bugatti believed that what he said was right and didn't really want anybody to, to criticize it or even suggest modifications. His father was a splendid chap called Carlo Bugatti. The family was brought up and the parents lived in Milan, which is a part of Italy, uh, famous still is, for both for metalwork and for art. His father, Carlo, was an incredible designer of furniture, a rather bizarre type, but full of admirable craftsmanship, using wood and a lot of parts from the decoration and splendid metalwork. He had two sons. The elder was a Tory, and the younger son was born three years later, and they called him Rembrandt. He, in fact, turned out to be an astonishingly good sculptor and his works are well known in the art world these days. He, he specialized in animals, what the French call an animalier. Unfortunately he was a rather sad chap and he died, took his own life in 1915, depressed by the, the war and the fact that he couldn't survive in his beloved Antwerp Zoo where he did most of his work in his sculpting. But to go back to young Ettore, he was supposed to be, being the elder, the one who was trained in art school. But he became much more interested in what you might call the mechanical arts of the period. And uh, he left his younger brother to be the fine artistic chap. At the time, he was a strange young man, a nice looking young chap, who affected odd costume. He was a bit, bit foppish, in fact. His costumes were almost as odd as some of his designs. The story has to start, really, with him joining a, a local bicycle firm and starting to race tricycles, which were built by this particular firm, by purchasing the Dion engines. The Dion engine was the easiest, most readily obtainable uh, single-cylinder engine. And in fact, he converted the bicycle. We think it was similar to this, but we're not sure. He put an extra engine on it to make two. Before 1900, he was doing a lot of racing along the roads of northern Italy and uh, earned a reputation for being a bit of a daredevil. Then, by courtesy of two friends of his family, the Counts Giulianelli, he was enabled actually to start designing and building his own car. It was a four-cylinder, four-wheel, chain-driven car with a proper gearbox and a, and a proper engine with at least one of the valves overhead. We're not sure of the details. And this was exhibited at one of the engineering shows in Milan in 1901. This was when he was 20 years old. A great big famous German firm, De Dietrich, visited this exhibition and were much struck by this car and arranged to take a license to manufacture it. And the young Atori goes off to Niederbrom to design. We're not sure of the, of the detailed arrangements, nor indeed, unfortunately, we've never been able to find out what happened to this first car. We know that he built a racing car, because we've got photographs of this. Uh, that's extraordinary. It's a version, that we think, of the original car. But he put himself at the back to steer from the rear. And sitting beside him is one of his young friends, Mathis, whose name you'll hear later on. You'll find throughout the whole history of Ettore Bugatti uh, this curious uh, trick 
of doing things differently from other people. What I suppose some people nowadays call lateral thinking. That's a shot of the actual first chassis. It was really a splendid piece of engineering. It had a four-cylinder engine with four of the valves were, were pulled down to open them. They weren't pushed up as an ordinary car. They were pulled down by pull rods as opposed to push rods. It had the ordinary sort of cone clutch of the period. And then the gearbox was, was just behind, well, underneath the driver. In fact, he sat on top of it. And then there was the usual chain drive of the period because people in those days didn't have live back axles. They had this chain drive to the rear wheels. Well, that was quite successful. They didn't make a great deal of them, but here's a shot of, of the car with a body. It looked quite reasonable. And certainly, some of them worked rather well. We've got one or two letters still in existence from customers who extolled the virtues of the car. We also got uh, access to correspondence of people grumbling about the unreliability. I think the real truth is that Bugatti was a sort of dilettante designer, very clever, but he didn't really spend a lot of time doing what we now call product development to get the bugs out of the, these early cars. And they must have had a lot of faults. When they worked, they probably worked very well, but they weren't necessarily very reliable. And certainly the arrangements with the Dietrich company suffered because he really did spend, as far as we can see, too much of his time racing. Anyway, he left Dietrich in 1904. There was a recession in the car world. They weren't selling very many. They found penetrating the, this difficult car world was too difficult. And they gave up and paid him off or got rid of him in some way or other. And he then set up with his friend Mathis and produced a rather elegant motor car and uh, made a few of these. There were still large cars, but uh, now, curious enough, instead of having both valves operated by pull rods, he operated one, the inlet valve by a pull rod pulling it down, and the exhaust valves were pushed up by conventional push rods. You'll find in, the, in his early history, he tried really everything, actually. It still, it was a nice car, so very similar in layout with the gearbox and the chain drivers before, and quite a good car, actually. That lasted for only two years, that arrangement with Mathis. They weren't able to commercialize the thing properly, although at least one came to England that was sold under the name Burlington. Then an interesting thing happened to Bugatti. There was a very fine and very well-known firm in Cologne, in Germany, called Deutz, and they decided they wanted to get into the car business, and they hired Ettore Bugatti in 1907 to design for them as a consulting designer, which was really quite a, a feather in his cap because it was a very fine firm. He produced two cars there. The first one was a splendid version of the same general layout as before with the gearbox in the middle and the chain drive. But now the engine had overhead valves not operated by pull rods or, any, or even push rods, but by a central camshaft, an overhead camshaft, a very modern design, and sort of curved tappets shaped like bananas which from a single camshaft middle pushed the valves down to open them. That was a good design. And later he refined it again, the same engine, but now he put for the first time a proper shaft drive in it with the layout that we see on the modern motor car with a gearbox here and the back axle of what is now more or less a conventional type. In fact, it was a modern design, in my judgment, a good design. And it's a pity that, um, as far as we know, none of, none of these cars exist. However, Deutz again had trouble penetrating a new market. They were very well known, very successful manufacturer of stationary engines, but even for a firm as able as that, it was not easy to penetrate into a new market. Now, a very interesting thing happened. While he was working for uh, Deutz, his arrangement enabled him to work as a consulting designer on his own, on the side, as it were. Well, he now decided to build a little car, what, the, what they called in those days a voiturette. He was probably stimulated by the voiturette racing in 1908, where there appeared a number of very lovely little cars, in particular a very pretty little Isotta Vashini. He then produced in his own home at uh, Cologne a miniature version of the car he'd just done for Deutz. It was a four-cylinder baby car with a little gearbox and a shaft drive to the back axle, like the bigger Deutz version, only what you would call today 1200cc engine. A very light, uh, handled beautifully, relatively fast. It would do in good condition, uh, well over 60 miles an hour, which was quite fast for those days. 
Certainly, the car created quite a sensation in his day, and it wasn't long before he was able to get some finance. He was probably by that time tired of working for other people. We may ask ourselves, how come Bugatti came to Molsheim? Well, the explanation is that he'd had a banking friend, a sporting friend of his, who lived in the Strasbourg area, Mr. Vizcaya, from the Spanish banking family, which still exists, incidentally. He knew of a disused dye works in this village of Molsheim and recommended Bugatti to go and look at it. This was the end of 1909. And Bugatti went there and bought the building presumably with help from his banking friends in Strasbourg. Here we are standing uh, outside the building with the factory entrance behind us and the villa which became the residential property of Bugatti from 1909 until the end in 1939. The other buildings around it were used for the offices and the design office and the factory buildings inside were where he built his original cars. I have got here an interesting early picture, probably taken in 1910 or 1911, showing his original prototype, Pure Sang, as it was called, Thoroughbred, and an early Deutz car, which he probably kept for souvenir. And in the background, some of his workmen and a number of chassis being built. And almost certainly, one of these chassis here is one of the cars that we're going to see shortly, belonging now to Mr. Peter Hampton in, in England. The engine design on this first little Bugatti car, which he did at his Molsheim factory, represents a style of design which Bugatti was to use more or less until the end, namely an aluminium crankcase, aluminium cast crankcase, bolted direct to the frame, on which is mounted a cylinder block, uh, usually four cylinders. When he had an eight-cylinder car, he would normally have two blocks in his early designs. And then on top of that, a cam box, as we call it, containing a camshaft and means of operating the overhead valves. Bugatti was one of the first designers to use uh, overhead valves, and really he used this on all his designs from 1910 onwards. The drive to the camshaft was taken on the front of the engine by a vertical shaft with bevel gears, one on the crankshaft and the other on the camshaft. And then there was a cross drive for the magneto on one side and the, and the water pump on the other side. The interesting feature of this little car is, in fact, the Ettore Bugatti signature, which was his trademark. And, in fact, it's the only model of his car where he was so bold as to use his own name on the cam box. This early model eight-valve car didn't have the later oval-shaped radiator, or horseshoe shape, if you like, which became the Bugatti feature which everybody almost recognized, but he only used this on the first three years of its production and went over to the oval radiator in 1913. The other feature which is worth stressing on this car is the, the balanced design. It's a lightweight car. He was very keen to reduce the weight. He used to argue, quite rightly, that weight was the enemy. And this is probably the first time that a car was neither a cycle car put together with bits of string and wire, or a heavy-duty car scaled down where some of the th sections, like the gears and whatnot, were of heavy duty, heavier than was needed. So that axle is all that you need for a car of this weight and, and performance. And other features of it, like the, the, the transmission, the back axle, and the gearbox are equally light, which helps to make the car extremely charming to drive in his very first catalogue he quotes an article by the famous author of the time, W.F. Bradley, who said that he managed to pass a much heavier car on bad roads by virtue of the maneuverability and light handling of this little car.
Ligeti still was interested in performing as a consulting designer after he opened his own factory, having regard to the fact that that's how he had existed up to 1910. And he produced a very interesting little tiny car with an 850, that's mini-sized engine, in 1912, almost like a shoe it was really. And he licensed this car to the Peugeot company. And it became known as the Baby Peugeot, which continued in manufacture even during the war. And no less than 3,000 of these were made, some coming to England. The next phase in the story is an interesting other diversion of his activity. He was still interested in producing a larger car, larger than the 13 or 1400cc car that he was producing in production in the period 1910 to 1914. He produced for himself a racing car with a five liter engine and used it in one or two odd competitions. Then he became friendly with a famous aviator who appeared, Roland Garros. He produced a version of this car for Roland Garros. It was a, a five-liter engine, as I mentioned, and still chain-driven, because he was not by then convinced that there wasn't something in the chain drive. The great advantage for competition cars, obviously, being that you could change the ratio of the back axle much more easily than an ordinary car, and therefore for competition work there was some justification in retaining the chain drive. This was a superb car produced with a body by La Bourdette. On the original print of this picture, you can actually read the maker's name on it. Now, Garros, unfortunately, was killed uh, in the war, but the car remained and came to England in the early 20s and is still preserved and popularly called Black Bess the name given it to by one of the lady owners, Ivy Cummings, who owned it and raced it very nobly in the early 20s. The engine is a handsome piece, overhead valves, of course, typically Bugatti, with the magneto drive in the front. Here's the steering box, the carburation. In those days, interesting enough, they didn't believe in short carburetor manifolds. They had quite long pipes. But that car still goes extremely well. In Bugatti's search for more power in 1914, he decided to build a special version of his little eight-valve engine with four valves per cylinder, something which nowadays our German and Japanese friends are extolling the virtues of. He produced three engines for a water rate race, which was unfortunately cancelled by the war in August 1914. But he buried the engines, or at least the top half of the engine, the new parts of the engine, at Molsheim when he left for uh, Italy and then later France during the war, where he spent all his time designing air engines. Well, uh, these engines were dug up after the war when he got his factory back in 1920, and they put them on chassis and entered them in a race at Le Mans in 1920, where he won with what was at that time a sensational speed of 55 miles an hour. This created a sensation in the press because no small car at that time was able to be driven so fast. And this really started Bugatti's reputation post-war as a maker of racing cars. And in the year following, he improved it still further by building some engines with roller bearings on the big ends and on the crankshaft, and entered five cars into the Brescia race in Italy for Waterettes, and came in and took the first four places at sensational speed. All this really cemented his reputation and got him into business as a successful producer of racing and sports cars. The success at Brescia led him to call the model the Brescia model, and forever afterwards it was known throughout its production run until it finished in the early 1926 as the Brescia Bugatti, in honor of the win at Brescia. On this Brescia engine, you've got the cylinder block down here with its four valves, two inlet and two exhaust. And on top of it, you have this aluminum casting, the cam box. In that rotates the camshaft. This is a typical camshaft. 
you can see the four cams here, two, in it, two exhaust. And then the problem Bugatti had, indeed all engine designers have had, is how to transmit the motion of the cam into the actual pushing of the valve. The classic solution is some sort of rocker or finger which oscillates up and down to act between the cam and the thing. But Bugatti, with typical ingenuity, thought of a different solution. He had what we call, jokingly now, banana tappets. These are arc-shaped followers, rectangular in section, but arc-shaped in side view. And these operate on the cam being pushed up and down by the cam as the cam rotates, the, the four different ones for the four different cams. And then at the other end, as they push up and down, this end operates the valves. These show the four valve centers. Well, he produced a batch of these little short chassis, so-called Type 13 racing cars, what was called in England the full brusher or the genuine racing brusher. And two of them came to England fairly quickly. And the, the first one was bought by a young racing undergraduate from Cambridge called Raymond Mays, who successfully campaigned the car and was winning every hill climb there was in the period 1922 to 1924. Meanwhile, production of the more subdued and longer wheelbase touring models continued using the same 16-valve engine, although the engine was slightly simplified. It only had, for example, a single magneto rather than the twin magnetos which you had on the racing one. And that was actually the most successful Bugatti ever made. They produced over 2,000, which is more than any other Bugatti model in the production run, as we said, up till early 1926. One advantage of the success that Bugatti achieved and all the publicity he was getting was that it interested other manufacturers in taking a license of the little car. First of all, Diato in Italy talked a bit and took a license, gave Bugatti some much needed money, although they don't appear to produce very many cars. There is one in existence still, as far as we know, in a museum in France, but otherwise the market disappeared. The next license was to a firm called Rabag, the Rhein Automobile Bau in Germany, who took a license and made quite a few of these cars, which were rather pretty and, and quite effective, although they altered them slightly. They altered the radiator a bit to have a bulge on it, although basically it was similar in style and shape to the Bugatti one. He had always wanted to produce in production a, a two or even a three liter car. And his first essay into this field was in 1920 when long before he really had the means to do it, he produced a remarkable eight-cylinder, three-liter car called the Type 28. It had an eight-cylinder engine with two cylinder blocks of a style which he was later to adopt for all his later cars until 1930, uh, with a cam box on top and now three valves, two inlets and one exhaust, as opposed to the four valves he'd had on the earlier car, or indeed the two valves he'd had on the pre-war car. And the three-valve design was to remain with him until 1932 when the big touring Type 57 took over with only two valves. It also had, interestingly enough, hydraulic front brakes. Hydraulic brakes in those days, not by Lockheed, but by Bugatti. Other interesting technical feature of the car was that the gearbox was in the back axle of the car, which has some technical advantages of simplicity, although it does increase this, what was called the unsprung weight of the back axle, which has to bounce up and down. But you can still see that the typical Bugatti construction with the reverse quarter elliptic springs, which he had introduced by now on all his cars, and the typical rigid frame at the back, able to support coachwork. It was perhaps fortunate that Bugatti was not able to commercialize the three-liter car, which was called the Type 28, because the racing formula, which had been a three-liter formula up till 1921, was changed for 1922 into a two-liter formula. And this enabled Bugatti to start work on a two-liter engine, which was smaller and therefore rather nearer his production ability than the big three-liter one. Here's a shot of the first of his two-liter engines, which was very important from the historical point of view, because the whole layout of this engine formed the basis of his next few years' production, 
and indeed the famous Type 35 racing car, which we come to later on. It had two cylinder blocks with a cam box on top, the same layout as the larger engine, but obviously scaled down. And the crankshaft in this case was carried on three roller bearings for an eight cylinder engine, which was adequate for up to, say, 4,000 revolutions, but was not good enough for very high speed, but worked well enough for the period. Another interesting feature of these cars was the use of a large cast bulkhead, which certainly improves the appearance. And in those days when he had his own foundry and the production runs were small, was a good way of doing things. In this case, this is a production version where the dynamo is mounted on the bulkhead and driven by a belt from the rear of the camshaft. Now, the first of these eight-cylinder cars were actually built for racing. And this is his car entered in the 1922 Strasbourg Grand Prix. The body was built locally, not at the factory, and with this rather curious long tail, and indeed the exhaust was taken out to the tail cone to the point at the end. And notice also the curious cowl put over to cover the radiator, which was something which was done for that race, but not used subsequently. Now the cars actually had some trouble with their brakes, we mentioned earlier on. And in fact, one of the drivers, Monis Mori, did more or less the whole of the race on his handbrake. But they were quite reliable, not as fast as the winning Fiat's, but they came in third and gave ample, excellent publicity to Bugatti, which he used to good effect. Now, one of these cars was bought by somebody who was to be famous later on, Mr. and Mrs. Eunuch. And here's Elizabeth Eunuch who became one of the most distinguished Bugatti drivers later on. They bought one of these cars and had it rebodied in Czechoslovakia, where they lived in Prague. We are breaking the sequence of our story just a little bit, because here on the south of France, we've got an opportunity of taking some pictures of two unique Strasbourg cars, and in the background, the original five-liter car which Ettore Bugatti used and raced. You can see in these three cars the beginnings of an interest in streamlining. The long tail on the five liter behind here, which in fact had a cowl over the radiator originally for racing. And then one of the actual Strasbourg cars with its long tailed bulbous body, the exhaust coming out of the tail behind me. And then here close is a beautiful bodied single seater built for running at Indianapolis in 1923. There were five cars built like this with these rather nice offset bodies. Unfortunately, because of the steering being on the right-hand side, the offset for Indianapolis should have been on the other side. But nevertheless, it had a very clean body, which was designed in detail by a well-known French aircraft designer called Bechereau. This is typical of the early hydraulic brakes. Uh, using a glycerine and water mixture uh, as used on the early Type 30s and indeed on the racing cars at that time. There's the oil or liquid fluid entry here and instead of the double shoe arrangement of the modern hydraulic brake, there was a single shoe pivoted on one end and pressed by a single hydraulic cylinder to expand into the drum. Clearly, therefore, it only worked in a forward direction and hardly worked at all in reverse. The actual master cylinder was a remarkable affair. This is a sample with the reservoir of oil on top of this master cylinder and a direct push pedal mounted in the cockpit so you could push it down directly, there being no lever. This was merely a guide to stop it turning around. It was frankly the, the, the trouble with the seals on this item that prevented it being reliable. And although when they were working, they worked quite well, they, they always were giving trouble. Apart from being interested in cars, he was actually quite a sportsman. He loved horses, he was always riding. In fact, there are many of the early pictures show him in riding garb, and he had a reputation when he had a factory of his own of wandering about the factory in riding clothes. He always kept horses. In fact, later on in the factory, it was astonishing. There was an awful lot of time and money spent on the stables and the various trappings that go around to that. He even started building horse-drawn vehicles. From the very earliest days, Bugatti seemed to be as interested in how things were made to his satisfaction 
as to what the parts they were making were. This meant that he spent quite a lot of his own time on the designing of the tools to manufacture the parts, the crankshafts and the cylinder blocks and things like that, which he just designed. This is unusual. In fact, I suppose it's unique in the car design world to get a manufacturer who's interested not only in the creation of the thing itself, but in the method of its manufacturer and the tools to make the product with. This meant that, for example, his factory was full of specially designed machinery or fittings, usually attached to the best type of milling machine, many of which came from America, where the best machines were in those days. And he extended this actually to making the bench vices. All the vices throughout the whole factory were Bugatti designed and manufactured, rather large, heavy, very, very effective vices, the best, you might call, almost the Rolls Royce of vices, which are still much sought after, and anybody who's used one wouldn't want to use another type of vice. For 1923, we see an example of Bugatti's divergence. His whole life was a mixture of brilliance and then you might say brilliantly stupid things. And certainly for 1923, most of us feel that the racing car he produced for the Grand Prix, which was then at Tours in France, was really an aberration. He had always resisted the argument that coachwork was important on cars because of the weight. He argued that the loss of performance due to the weight of the body was more important than the benefit from streamlining. But he had been persuaded against his judgment, we think, to have a body put on the 22 car, which wasn't too bad. And then he decided, for reasons which we don't know, to produce an aerodynamically designed car for the 23 Grand Prix. He produced a car which was really an aerofoil section of a wing, except that it was rectangular in front view and had a high frontal area. Now these cars had an extremely short wheelbase, shorter than the previous year, reduced from 2.4 meters down to 2 meters. And because of the type of aerofoil section, one created lift on the top surface of the wing, as it were, which tended to lift the car slightly at high speed. And because the frontal area was fairly generous, the body straddled the wheels, the total drag was in fact fairly substantial. Now this car was not a success. The road holding was poor, Although it was actually fast, it managed to do about 120 miles an hour on a time sprint. It was certainly very difficult to handle, and it had no success at all in the race. After the race, he sold one to the Unix in Prague, and they used it for a bit and actually returned it, sent it back to the factory in exchange for the later car the year following, because they weren't happy with it. It was extraordinary in the sense that the driver sat virtually on top of the engine and there was no bulkhead proper between the engine and the driver, something which is not permitted quite rightly today. The monitor was in the cockpit, everything was accessible more or less, but it must have been a very uncomfortable ride for the drivers. Now, after this race, something happened which made Bugatti change direction. My own opinion is that he'd seen the Fiat's, which were successful in the 1923 race, and I think he said to himself, what my Italian friends can do, I can do better. This was a good-looking car with a nice streamlined body. It had a, an interesting hollow axle, which was very light and ingenious, with the springs passing through the axle, but their axle was made in two pieces. And what I think Bugatti must have done was he must have gone home and said, I am going to do better than the Fiat. And he then sat down and designed what was to be one of the classic racing cars of all times. First of all, he improved the engine. The top half of the engine was basically the same as his production Type 30, except the compression ratio was raised. It had the two cylinder blocks and two carburetors, one feeding each block, and the camshaft over the top. 
But now he put the Renito in the dash here, driven off the end of the camshaft. And he built this round a completely new chassis frame, where the frame was wasted at the back to follow the lines of a streamlined tail, so he could produce a body similar to that on the Fiat. The other major engine change was to introduce a roller bearing crankshaft. The limitation on his earlier engine, which had three ball bearings on the crankshaft and plain white metal begins fed by squirted oil, the weakness of that was that at high speed there was not enough oil to cool the bearings and you would tend to run a bearing or throw a connecting rod. So he decided to do what other engine designs were doing, to fit a built up crankshaft using roller bearings which avoided the issue of getting adequate oil to a plain bearing because the roller bearing doesn't generate so much heat and doesn't need anything like as much oil to cool it as a plain bearing. This was a, a brilliant piece of engineering and a good example of the best of Bugatti's design work. The crankshaft are built up in sections of really hard, case-hardened steel ground all over. And then the alignment of the various sections of the crankshaft to get the timing you want was done by cross cotter pins, exactly as indeed is done on a bicycle. You will understand that a bicycle, the two pedals, are kept in the correct orientation at 180 degrees by the cross cotter pins. And you can vary the angle very slightly by altering the angle of the cotter pin. Well, that's exactly what Bugatti did. In order to get the crank true and, and balanced properly, all you had to do, although it did take some time in the factory indeed, to alter the cotter pin angles by selecting cotter pins at different angles to get the matter perfectly in alignment. Now the complete car had this admirably wasted frame which enabled the tail to envelop the frame at the rear. There were two other major innovations. First of all, there was a hollow axle. The Fiat, as I have mentioned, had hollow axles, but they were cut in the middle and joined together to enable you to bore them out. Now, Bugatti went one better, and he produced an axle which was closed at the ends and hollow in the middle, which is paradoxical. Achieved, indeed, by making the axle from a forging straight, boring it right through, hammering down the ends at each end to close them, and then bending them to get the sort of S shape, and then finish polishing them all over. Meanwhile, the springs are taken through boxes in the axle, and so you get the extraordinary Bugatti paradox of a hollow axle that closed at both ends. And you have to think hard how he made it. He kept his old radiator, but now to keep the aerodynamics better, he reduced the size of the radiator, enabling the whole body to taper from the narrow point, widened as it went past the passengers, and then closed up at the tail at the end. A very handsome body. If today you look at that body, the way they've divided the panels up, it's almost impossible to suggest how you could make it better looking. It's really a, a virtually perfect example of what today we would call industrial design. Now this car appeared at the 1924 show, which was at Lyon. They managed to produce five cars, which created a sensation because they really were extremely good looking and certainly the best looking cars there. Now in the race, unfortunately, all was not well. The car had been fitted with the final modification, cast aluminum wheels with detachable rims to save a bit of weight. But unfortunately, the tires used were not properly cured. And during the race, almost all the tires they had failed. And the race was, from Bugatti's point of view, a disaster. Only car was running at the end. And he really went away very upset Although, in fact, the performance of the car was surprisingly good. And all the novel features, apart from the tires, which weren't really novel, had been proved beyond doubt as to be excellent. He was very depressed about this, but his customers were faithful and rallied around him, and he managed to sell all the first batch of cars without any difficulty. One of the first ones came to England, another one went to Prague, to Elizabeth Eunuch, and he had more success in fact, on the second outing of the car at San Sebastian in the end of September 1924, when his car came in second in the Grand Prix there. That cheered him up, no doubt. 
the response from the marketplace to the visual appearance of this new car was really quite outstanding. And in the early months of 1925, he produced his replica car, which looked exactly the same as the full-blooded racing car, but had wire wheels and the engine was simplified. It didn't have a roller bearing crank. It had the touring crankshaft and bearing from the production Type 30. It was called a Tecla in France, popularly, because Tecla was the current type of replica pearls, which the older women will remember. Anyway, this little car was also an immediate success because it gave the impecunious purchaser opportunity to drive a car which looked exactly like the full-blooded Grand Prix car, but was about half the price to buy. At the end of 1925, he also produced a new four-cylinder engine, and this was put into two cars. He had been developing this because while the production of the Brescia had kept the factory going and the output had really gone up to over 2,000 cars, this had been paying the wages, as it were, all during the 24, 25, and 26 period. There was a need for a better model and he produced in the first place this four-cylinder engine, which was what he needed to produce a small one-and-a-half-litre car. He did two things with that. First of all, he put it in the Grand Prix chassis and produced a splendid little car, which looked identical with the other eight-cylinder wire-wheeled car, the 35A, and that ceased production, and it was replaced by the Model 37, which was a splendid little four-cylinder car. Very much appreciated, and sold widely all over the world because it was simple. It had a four-cylinder engine with plain bearings, not these complicated roller bearings, and it offered for a modest price of the young blood of the day a splendid little sports car. The other thing he did was to produce an excellent grand sport car with a rather nice little close couple body with the same engine in a new chassis, slightly more robust than the Brescia, but on the same general lines, but with good brakes and all the qualities of steering and everything that the earlier models had. That was a splendid little car called the Type 40 and was produced for a relatively modest price. It sold for about one third of the price of the full blooded Grand Prix car and really competed with the better quality four cylinder cars of the period, something that sold for about 350 pounds in England, something like that which was really quite a modest price for a car of this quality. The next stage in the development was the development of improved versions of the racing car for the 26th season. Uh, he didn't in fact start doing superchargers until later at the end of 1926 but in early 26, he produced a 2.3 litre car, initially without a supercharger. And then by the Monza Grand Prix, he'd managed to add a supercharger to the engine. To explain what he did to the engine, he put a drive on the front here up to the supercharger and put the carburetor down below and then fed up with this manifold into the cylinder blocks. Well, the only modification, in fact, was the drive, and the blower and a different carburetor and the manifolding. In fact, it was relatively simple to convert the engine from one to the other. But apart from that, it is really very difficult to tell a supercharged car from an unsupercharged car, except that there is a little telltale hole. The expert will notice on the real car a little hole in the bonnet up here, which corresponds to the supercharged relief valve. Anyway, that car was introduced in the early part of 1927. Bugatti had a good year in 1925. He won almost everything in 1926. It was his real golden year. He won the world championship. He won all the major Grand Prix. It was his, certainly his peak year in performance. He had a relatively good year in 1927, except that racing in Europe had come to a grinding halt in those days. 
there was a lot of arguing about the Formula Libre, as it was called, the free formula. Nobody could make up the mind what they wanted the racing formula to do. And there were a lot of independent races run, and uh, there was no proper pattern in the racing in the period 1927 to 28. He produced his supercharged car, 35B, which was really the most famous of the racing Bugattis produced up to 1930, the car which everybody seems to want to have nowadays, a very beautiful machine and a very good performance. A good 35B, for example, can be taken out today on a racetrack and it can do well over 125 miles an hour without any difficulty at all. And if you put it on alcohol fuel, it'll really exceed that. So it was a splendid car which could do a standing kilometer, in fact the world's record it, it had held it appeared, in something of the order of 28 seconds, which is really quite quick for a kilometer compared to a good modern sports car. Well then we come to 28 where he went along racing this car, but the real problems started by 1929. The Wall Street crash came and the whole of financial climate in Europe by the end of the 29, the beginning of 1930, was pretty disastrous. And although the production of the 35B continued, and a few were made in 1929, it tailed off in 1930, and something better was needed. <laughs>